Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this panel debate on uh, law enforcement uh, without borders, uh, access to electronic data under the European Production Order and the US Cloud Act. I'm glad to see that the room uh, is filled in, and despite the fact that uh, oh, this is the third panel dealing with this topic. I think there's quite a lot of interest still and a lot of questions to be addressed. My name is Marco Stefan. I am a research fellow at CEPS, uh, the Center for European Policy Studies. I work there as a, at the uh, Justice and Norm Affairs section. Our moder I'll be the chair for this panel. And our moderator is uh, uh, right uh, beside me, is Jason Byros. He's a senior fellow at the <coughs> Brussels Privacy Hub and uh, a former legal advisor at the US uh, mission to the European Union. Uh, as already mentioned, this uh, is not a new topic. There have been already a few uh, panels uh, addressing questions related to law enforcement cross-border access to electronic data. This, of course, <coughs> has been a priority <coughs> for legislators both in the EU and in the US during the past years. And um, <coughs> these uh, legislative and political efforts have uh, led in the US to the adoption of the US Cloud Act, which uh, was meant to, at least in the first part of, uh, of it, to address the uh, question that underlied the uh, Microsoft uh, uh, Warren case, uh, whereas in fact Microsoft challenged the <coughs> power of the US law enforcement authority to order disclosure of data which are stored uh, outside the US territory. And uh, in parallel, the uh, EU has stable proposal for the uh, so-called European Production and Preservation Order, as well as for a directive uh, for the appointment of legal representative of service provider providing service within the uh, European Union. Uh, now, uh, both instruments present their own specificities, although uh, they also present, uh, propose a model of cooperation which is significantly diff different from the one which uh, currently exists under, uh, for instance, instruments such as the uh, Mutual Legal Assistance Agreement or uh, within the European Union, the European Investigation Order. Now, while these two, uh, let's say, classical uh, judicial cooperation instruments uh, foresee the involvement of judicial authorities in the country where an executive uh, or a, a, an order to disclose data is to be executed, the uh, US Cloud Act and the um, European Production Order uh, foresee a new model of cooperation based on private public cooperation. So, uh, law enforcement authority will be able to address uh, requests directly to service providers across borders. Now, uh, previous research and also debate that uh, has been you know, ongoing even uh, during this past few days has shown that in fact direct uh, cooperation between uh, law enforcement and service provider uh, bring the risk of uh, conflict of law, and uh, which uh, lead us to the main question that uh, we'll try to address uh, in this panel, which is, is the internet really borderless? And uh, when a request can be considered simply as a domestic issue or when it is in fact across cross border? And is the involvement of uh, uh, the judicial authority in the issuing state enough to prevent conflict of law and to uh, ensure that the uh, necessary safeguards are respected, not just in the issuing country, but also in the country where uh, a law enforcement measure, in particular request for data, is to be executed. And uh, we brought together an um, interesting uh, group of experts uh, from different institutions uh, and organizations to, uh, you know, uh, hopefully they will be able to address these questions in uh, this limited time that we have available. And uh, I invite them to be uh, briefly concise in the presenta this presentation, so to allow enough room for uh, debate, not just among them, but also with you, the, the audience. Uh, and I uh, invite you all to prepare your question and, and really uh, engage with us in, in this discussion. And with this, I'd like to pass the floor to Jason. Thank you, Marco. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, looking forward to a lively conversation um, with our panelists on, on an issue that I find uh, Fascinating for a number of reasons, but not least because it is a classic transatlantic issue where each side is extremely angry at the other for doing exactly what they're doing. Um, it's just a classic European-American um, dynamic, I think. Um, about five or six years ago, I was working at the State Department in Washington, and I was working as a lawyer on a law enforcement portfolio that included our relations with the United Kingdom. 
And one of my contacts at the UK Embassy in Washington came to me and said, well, we have this idea. We, have, we, we, we could create an agreement between the United States and the United Kingdom, and it would allow us to get data in the other, in the other country without going through the mutual legal assistance process. And I told him, there's no way that will ever happen. Um, I'm still buying him beers to this day, and he cons constantly reminds me as how successful they were in convincing the U.S. government that it was a good idea. Um, and as that developed, we see, as Marco intimated, um, a fairly uh, comparable, some would argue more aggressive approach for a similar uh, system with the European production order. So I look forward to the perspectives of, my, of our uh, co-panelists, and we'll start with Michel Dubrocard who is following e-evidence as an administrator, uh, file as an administrator for the European Parliament, um, working on the Libe Committee. She is, uh, she has previ previously been with the French government and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, the French Embassy in The Hague, the French permanent representation here in Brussels, as well as at the Council for the European Union and um, working as the JHA attache. So Michelle, I'll leave it to you. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, the first question uh, which may come to mind uh, uh, is uh, how come the Parliament hasn't uh, adopted yet his draft report on the e-evidence file uh, uh, where the Council has already reached a general approach uh, last December. And indeed, uh, there were times where the opposite has happened. Some of us in this room uh, can certainly remember the lengthy negotiations on the GDPR or in another field, uh, the regulation on the European border and Coast Guard. As regards this very proposal, I mean, of course, the e-evidence proposal, it may be reminded that the Commission itself uh, has uh, also spent quite a bit of time before presenting its proposal since it's, uh, it issued almost uh, one year before in uh, June 2017, a non-paper presenting several options aiming at allowing direct access to data retained by service providers <coughs> uh, for law enforcement authorities. However, uh, between the day when the rapporteur in the Libé Committee, Mrs. Zibel, uh, was designated, uh, which was in May 2018, and today a lot of work has been completed, um, exchanges of views in the Libé uh, Committee in June and September uh, 2018, of course, several technical meetings with experts coming from direct uh, from different um, areas, uh, academics, service providers, four shadow shadows meetings, and moreover, a four hours uh, hearing uh, last November. The rapporteur has decided to continue the work by drafting with the shadows reporters several working documents before the end of the parliament term. These document, uh, documents will focus on specific issues which need further consideration. The first document uh, has already been presented. It was last December, and it is made available on the parliament's website. Two other uh, working documents will be soon discussed in um, a Libby meeting beginning of February. What is at stake? The rapporteur, Mrs. Zippel, has constantly stated that she fully shared the goal pursued by the Commission, namely the possibility for the EU law enforcement authorities and the judicial authorities to get more quickly and more efficiently the e-evidence throughout the Union. However, the proposal raises several legal issues which need to be tackled. The first working document is general and presents the main legal areas which need further clarification. The following working documents will focus on the scope of application of the new proposal and its relations with other existing instruments meaning uh, the EIO and also the, what, what is happening now in uh, Strasbourg with the Cybercrime Convention, uh, the, the execution of the EU production order and the role of service providers, the relation with third country laws, the, the conditions for issuing uh, EU production orders, the safeguards and remedies, and finally the enforcement of the EU production order. The first working documents 
already gives some indications of the questions raised. Firstly, the legal basis of the proposal. Some of you, um, if not all of you, know that it's Article 82.1 TFEU, uh, which foresees judicial cooperation in criminal matters. That's the article the, which is supposed to be the legal basis of the proposal. However, according uh, with this, um, to this article, such judicial cooperation can exist between judicial authorities of two member states and not between a judicial authority of one member state and on the one hand, and a private company located in another member state on the other hand. The Commission uh, recognizes itself that such interpretation of Article 82.1 is quite broad. Therefore, the question is whether such legal basis would be acceptable according to the current case law of the Court of Justice. Secondly, the nature of the data involved. The Commission has introduced in its proposal four categories of data, namely subscriber data and um, access data, transactional data and content data. Depending on these categories, the request to get these data would have to be validated either by a prosecutor or a judge. However, these definitions seem to require some clarification especially in light of sensitive metadata, which could fall under different categories involving different legal requirements. Moreover, other EU instruments have already established different definitions of data categories. Thirdly, the role given to service providers. The proposal foresees the transfer of certain rights and obligations to private service providers. In particular, the service providers would be empowered to assess the order's compliance with the Charter or to determine if such order is manifestly abusive. The question here is whether private companies um, should have the authority to perform such tasks. In the Council General Approach text, however, this possibility given to service providers was deleted this deletion raises another issue, which is the absence of any assessment of the validity of the, of the orders. Um, the role given to the service providers by the Commission may also have some consequences as regards their liability on the one hand. Um, they may receive sanctions for not executing a, pro a production order, but on the other hand, they also can be bound by other rules like EU data protection rules or even third, law, uh, third country laws. Sorry. Um, and finally, the scope of the regulation. According to the proposal, production orders for subscriber and access data could be issued for all criminal offenses, while they could be issued from transactional and content data only if the criminal offenses are punishable in the issuing state by a custodial sentence of a maximum of at least three years. This means that orders could be sent for offenses which are not deemed criminal in the member states where the service providers are located. In other words, the principle of double criminality doesn't seem to apply anymore. Before concluding, uh, let me say a few words on the Cloud Act. This new piece of legislation hasn't been assessed by the Libe Committee so far, although it might be examined uh, at a later stage in the framework of the, the discussions on the proposal of the Commission on e-evidence. Uh, indeed, both texts seem to present a lot of similarities since both circumvent the traditional MLATs in order to have a quicker access to e-evidence. I would also mention in this context the recent announcement by the Commission uh, on the adoption on February, next February 6th, uh, of a proposal uh, for a draft mandate for negotiations of an EU-US agreement on direct access to data stored by service providers. According to Mrs. Uh, Jourova, the Commissioner, the agreement would be necessary to collect evidence and prevent conflicts of laws, and it should have safeguard and protection. What is not totally clear at this stage is how such negotiation shall be conducted, since the Commissioner expressly stated that they wouldn't follow the pattern provided for uh, in the Cloud Act.
In any event, the Libe Committee will closely follow the negotiations between the EU and the US authorities, and it expects the Commission to keep the Committee fully informed at all stages of a procedure pursuant Article 218 uh, 10 of the TFU. In conclusion, um, in a recent article, uh, which was um, kindly provided to, to me, Mr. Theodor uh, Christakis considered that the Libby Committee on the e of the EU Parliament was moving like a tortoise. I can't resist the pleasure of reminding him this sentence from Jean de La Fontaine, uh, rien ne sert de courir, il faut partir à point. <laughs> Namely, and nothing is gained by running if you don't know start on time. In other words, in the Libby Committee, it seems that quality, uh, quality prevails over speed. Thank you. Thank you, Michel. Um, next, I'm going to ask Etienne Mochy uh, to speak. He's with the European Data Protection Authority in France, which is known as the Camille, Camille pardon. Um, before that, he was a policy advisor of, for the Libe Committee as well and participated in the legislative process leading up to the GDPR. Thank you very much and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'll start by saying that the, the overall issue of um, law enforcement access to data is something that has been uh, keeping data protection authorities busy since, since quite a, a long time already. Um, we're actually at national level um, in charge of overseeing such access via national law. Um, at European level as well, uh, we've been um, assessing and uh, giving recommendations about the, the, the legal framework at EU level. And of course, we even had to take positions sometimes about the issue of law enforcement access um, uh, in third country when we were, for example, assessing um, um, draft adequacy decision by the Commission regarding um, uh, the access to the data which is transferred to a third country. Um, more recently, the uh, European Data Protection Board, so the group of uh, EU uh, Data Protection Authority, has adopted uh, two documents which are official positions. One is actually from the Working Party 29. It was an overall statement on access to electronic evidence, and it was actually uh, prepared when the European Commission was consulting before its proposal on, on, on e-evidence with several options. And um, uh, last year, we issued an official opinion on the um, uh, proposal uh, for regulation of the European Commission. So I'll just start by, um, let's say, what are the key messages from the data protection authorities regarding uh, uh, this proposal? And then uh, uh, maybe I'll continue with, with potential issue of conflict of law, maybe with regard to other law in other jurisdictions. Regarding the Commission's proposal, um, the authorities have basically had quite a critical um, opinion on the, the Commission's proposal, and I could like summarize it because of time uh, in, in three main messages. First, messages, um, first message was that the text proposed by the Commission uh, does not provide sufficient guarantees for data subject. And if we can like, isolate one among others, is the fact that data subject uh, with the mechanism foreseen by the Commission cannot exercise their rights uh, effectively, um, for example, under specific condition, of course, and uh, this is also foreseen by law, um, information and access rights can be limited. However, what DPAs have said is that in such cases, data protection authorities should be able to exercise the rights of the data subject indirectly, uh, which is the case in a lot of, uh, for example, national uh, legal framework, uh, and to do so, the authorities, they have to be informed or able to control um, access requests. And this was not the case, not present in the Commission's proposal. Second main message is from, um, from our opinion on the e-evidence proposal was that the burden on, on companies uh, to ensure respect of procedural and fundamental rights is too heavy. Uh, they are actually data controller not in position to ensure this role instead of public authorities. First of all, of course, and it has been mentioned um, with the Commission proposal, the abandonment of the principle of dual criminality um, makes very complicated for a com company to assess the legality of the request because you would have to assess legality of a legal order which is not its own legal order. Um, and actually, then companies would then become responsible for determini determining if whether or not there is a conflict um, of law. And um, we have assessed that this should not be the responsibility of a com company. We however welcome that the Commission in its proposal was um, foreseeing uh, 
a mechanism for a dialogue um, with foreign authority in case of conflict of law with a third country jurisdiction. Uh, however, we had some reservation because we saw he was not strong enough and provided in two limited cases. So we have uh, a made proposal to reinforce this. Um, the only thing we can say is that now indeed the parliament is still working on, on, on its position. Um, the, the council, so the member states have adopted their general approach and we're not convinced that all our recommendations have been uh, taken on board by the member states. Um, and the third message is that uh, with this proposal uh, presented by the commission, uh, we think there's a risk of confusion with other uh, piece of EU law, mainly, um, and mainly uh, regarding definition and, and material scope uh, of the different instruments. For example, with the GDPR, there's a, um, there's a, doesn't match in terms of definition and scope the issue of establishment or representative. These are really two different notions, so it might be confusing actually for data controller to understand whether um, what's the representative according to e-evidence or to uh, the GDPR. Uh, and regarding material scope, there's really a, 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 a mismatch, I would say, with also a definition put forward in the e-privacy uh, uh, proposal um, regarding content data, non-content data, and it doesn't match what the Commission has foreseen in, in terms of distinction between um, different categories of data in the e-evidence proposal. So that's, in a nutshell, uh, what is said in, in the opinion, uh, which is much more lengthy and available online. Uh, quickly, uh, uh, to conclude, and then maybe we can talk about it during discussion, the issue of conflict of law raised by uh, other uh, uh, law in other jurisdictions, maybe the Cloud Act, but there might be other as well. Um, what we, we are not legislators, we operate with the current legal framework and we operate on the basis also of the case law of the Court of Justice of the European Union. And on this, whether it's within the EU or outside the EU, the court has already clearly defined what are the substantive and material conditions for access uh, to uh, data. And it has, it has to be, of course, in line uh, with EU primary and secondary law, mainly the GDPR. So in a case of, um, let's say, request uh, from a court or an authority of a third country that would be addressed directly to a service provider um, with, with subject to the GDPR, uh, the question is, uh, would that be a disclosure which is not authorized by EU law? So that's the wording of Article 48 of the GDPR. Um, Article 48 says that a request or a court decision may only be recognized or enforceable um, if it is based on an international agreement such as uh, an MLAT. Um, what's important to say, even though it's under Chapter 5 about transfer, Article 48, it's not a legal base for transfer. Article 48, uh, it's actually a provision that determines in which condition a third country request might be enforceable or recognized within EU jurisdiction, and therefore, in which condition a request might be compelling the data controller or processor, which is subject to the GDPR. Um, so in the absence of international agreements uh, that could indeed foresee this compelling or this enforceability of the request, um, there's a risk indeed the situation for data controller or processor that might be sitting between uh, two, <clears throat> let's say, obligation. One, to comply with the request from the third country authority, and if they do not comply, they might face sanction or judicial proceeding. The other is that if they answer um, the request from a third country authority, there might be, uh, I mean, there are possible examples, but there might be uh, in violation of uh, Article 48 uh, of the GDPR. So that's uh, like the main identified conflict uh, of law and, and probably the, um, the, the questions uh, might uh, come back soon. I mean, that's an issue that has been identified by the European Data Protection Authorities. We're working internally on this. We don't have like official position, but probably the involvement also of the development, maybe uh, for a possible uh, EU-US agreement in this field, will lead to the um, European Data Protection Authorities to take a formal position on, on this issue. Thanks. Thank you, Etienne. Uh, now we'll get a little bit of perspective from industry. Uh, Alexander Lafitte is the vice president of Euro SPA, which is the world's largest association of internet service providers. Um, before that, she was a fellow at the German parliament, and she also uh, is in charge of both European affairs and online content re uh, regulation and uses 
at the French Telecoms Federation. Thank you for this kind of, of introduction. Hello, everyone. Um, as mentioned, I represent here Euro ISPA, uh, which has been around for over 20 years old, and represents uh, 2,500 ISPs, uh, so that's short for internet service providers from European and EFTA regions. And it gathers big ISPs, such as traditional telcos, also what some call the invisible 85%, which are SMEs. And what we've seen over the last few years is an understandable, and, uh, understandable need for um, law enforcement authorities to accelerate and simplify access to cross-border electronic evidence. And two legislations were mainly produced, the US Cloud Act, which was enacted in March 2018, and the evidence proposal, uh, first introduced in April, and still in discussion. And this e-evidence proposal has sparked a lot of concern within the industry, but also in the civil society, because it represents a significant shift in the cross-border access to e-evidence. Because before, you had the MLATs, and they contained important checks and balances and gave a lot of scrutiny right to the enforcing state. And now in Europe, you will have European production and preservation orders that come directly to the internet service provider in the hopes of big efficiency, but that in our mind lacks safeguards. And this creates a lot of legal uncertainty for ISPs and especially for SMEs. This legal uncertainty is characterized in several ways. Um, first of all, we have a disparity in member states for what is a crime that is punishable by three plus years of prison. You um, have a multiplicity of law enforcement authorities across Europe whereas we would recognize a single point of contact. There is a lack of transparency and notification to users and member states, and you have unworkable timeframes, especially in cases of emergency, that are practically unworkable for ISPs and especially for SMEs. And so we have this approaching framework in the EU that creates a lot of legal uncertainty, and to that, we add another layer, which is the Cloud Act. Because the Cloud Act expands the scope of the um, Stored Communication Act, and it includes not only companies from the US, but also companies operating in the US and company uh, processing uh, US citizen data. And so what it means is that the location of the data is no longer relevant. And it can create an issue for ISPs with regard to conflict of law, because <coughs> We have, on the one hand, the US Cloud Act, and on the other hand, Article 48 of the GDPR that precludes a disclosure of data without an MLAT or an international agreement. So, to put it shortly, ISPs are kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. And we believe that a solution could, is contained in the second component of the Cloud Act. Um, meaning the introduction of the bilateral executive agreement. Those um, bilateral executive agreements in the Cloud Act are limited to serious crimes and could include real-time interception, which could be highly problematic um, for, first of all, on a technical level for ISPs, but also with regards to due process and fundamental rights. But it would still have the advantage on putting internet service providers in a clearer and a safer position. With regards to like a hypothetical um, executive agreement, my colleague at Libe um, explained it earlier. So the EU has stated it has exclusive competence over drafting such an agreement, and a first mandate should be released by the Commission next week. And our hopes is that will um, bring into the agreement the high level of data protection and cyber security that we have in the European Union. However, what some might fear is that this agreement will likely reflect like, the e-evidence framework, which, as I explained, creates a lot of legal uncertainty and risk um, for both ISPs and European citizens. And therefore, we think that, that um, there should be clear safeguards um, with regards to authentication and the verification of requests, uh, dual criminality assurances, 
a clarification on the, of the liability of uh, internet service providers that are put in this very complicated place. And of course, a notification of the user so that it can enforce its rights, but also of member states so that it can have a scrutiny rate and a high level of, of oversight. So in the meantime, we still are going with this uh, MLAT procedure, which, uh, as I um, explained, has like this high level of due process and uh, member state oversight. And it also has the advantage that uh, internet service providers are accustomed to it. And we believe as an industry that um, the future fra framework for um, cross-border evidence access in European and the US should um, contain two main things, which is legal certainty for everyone and clear safeguards with regards to due process. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alexandra. Um, now I'll ask Laure baudrier gerard to join, uh, join the, the discussion. She's a Fair Trials senior lawyer specializing in EU law and leads Fair Trials engagement on EU criminal justice policy and with the European regional courts in Luxembourg and Strasbourg. Thank you for the introduction and for inviting me to join this panel. So hi, everyone. Um, so at Fair Trials, we understand law enforcement's need for modern tools to collect data that they need to investigate and prosecute crime. And in this discussion, privacy organizations have a hugely important contribution to make about how the changes will impact on privacy and data protection. As do tech companies, who are understandably confused and perturbed by the current situation, and wondering how, what this all means for them and what their role will be between balancing support for law enforcement and building consumer trust while building a successful global business. And we think looking at impact on fairness of criminal justice is crucial as well. Not just because that's what fair trials is all about, but also because if these tools are used fairly and proportionally, they're more likely to maintain public trust. Because criminal justice isn't just about new tools for prosecutors in law enforcement, justice means much more than that. It requires a fair process and a fair outcome. And because while we have no doubt that 99% of law enforcement only want to use these powers properly, we all know that this isn't always the case. And we need to insulate against that to protect the um, reputation of legitimate law enforcement agencies, as well as those who could become the victim of abuse. So we're talking here about US-EU cooperation, because we all know that the arrangement for e-data access for law enforcement that gets agreed here will become the model for the rest of the world. So let me start with an example of how law enforcement use of e-data can devastate people's lives. This isn't all abstract. I don't know if any of you have heard about the Liam Allen case in the UK, a young 20-year-old student who was accused and charged of rape. After a two-year investigation, which he described himself as mental torture, he was cleared after previously undisclosed messages from the alleged victim's phone indicated that there had been consent and therefore no offense. The investigating police officer in the case admitted that he made a mistake. He thought he'd gone through all the 57,000 text messages from the alleged victim's phone, but he hadn't. And this case is not alone. The UK Prosecution Service is currently reviewing 600 cases of rape and sexual offenses following this public outcry about the failure of the system. What evidence is gathered and how and when it is shared with the defense can and does make a difference between justice and injustice. It makes a difference between public trust in justice and public outrage at injustice. And we're really concerned about the fact that this is evidence and is crucial to the fair or unfair outcome of a criminal case gets <coughs> lost in this debate about e-evidence. But physical and electronic evidence shouldn't be in, treated any differently when it comes to the right to a fair trial. And at Fair Trials, we've been looking at the practice of cross-border cooperation for a number of years, both in the context of the EU, with the European Arrest Warrant, the fast-track system for the arrest and extradition of people within the EU, and also internationally through Interpol and its system of international wanted persons notices. And what we are seeing is that when you move into international cooperation, the basic and crucial challenge of ensuring fairness and proportionality seems to get forgotten. 
it gets lost amongst the complexity of the fact that you're facing different legal systems and different legal cultures and different safeguards. And rather than to try to find common standards, what seems to happen is that states tend to apply no questions asked approach and place too much trust in other countries to make proper requests for assistance. But this approach as it stands today is not sustainable. We're seeing it in the context of the European arrest warrant, which is being tried as a result of the rule of law crisis in Poland. The EU Commission itself now recognizes that there needs to be human safeguards with between EU member states themselves. So what I'd like to emphasize today is that any framework for EU-US cooperation, whether we reach an executive agreement or not, needs to contain safeguards to prevent conflicts, prevent injustice, and promote trust. And since I only have a few minutes, I'll need to just focus on three such safeguards. The first are ex-ante safeguards. So safeguards that apply before a um, request for e-data is issued, something that the LIBA committee has highlighted as well. Second, ex post safeguards to enable the person concerned to challenge evidence that's obtained on the basis of the request. And third, oversight over law enforcement's use of these production orders um, and also use of the data that they obtain from them. So first, ex ante safeguards. What's on the table? On the one hand, the European production order proposal specifies that requests need to be necessary and proportionate with no further criteria like a sufficient degree of suspicion. Now, this is a common test that we find in the EAW and the European Investigation Order Directive, which enables member states to cooperate um, on the gathering of evidence. And we're seeing that it's simply not effective in producing, in preventing abusive use, such as fishing expeditions. On the other hand, the US has a probable cause standard that requires the issuing authority to show that the evidence relevant to an investigation is likely to be found in the communication that is sought. And this is apparently a very high standard, as currently many law enforcement requests are being rejected on that basis. So there's a clear different set of standards here and a risk of conflict. And if we want real global cooperation, we should try to agree broad rules on a meaningful hurdle for such requests, especially if the proposal is to get rid of the receiving judicial authority. We shouldn't be expected to just have to trust the requesting authority to get it right and respect all the rules. And we shouldn't be expected to, tr to trust the tech companies to do the job of policing law enforcement authorities. So second, ex post safeguards. Once the data, uh, the request has been acceded to and the genie's out of the bottle, what options are there? I want to talk about two things that could be addressed to give more meaningful safeguards, especially if there's no second judicial authority. First, notification of the person concerned, and second, exclusion of evidence. Well, under the current EU uh, proposal as redrafted by the Council, the person concerned will not even know about the request. No, notifi no notification is the default position. And as long as you don't know, you can't exercise your right to challenge the request, and you can't, exercise, uh, the, you can't challenge the admissibility of the electronic data as evidence. And it's not clear that this would be acceptable from a US perspective either, where I understand that gagging orders need to be justified and exceptional and also time barred. Now, once the person knows about the request, the European production order gives the person the right to challenge the request before the court of the issuing country, so not necessarily his own country, and only during the criminal proceedings in which the data that's been obtained is being used. But the production order fails to specify what remedies you could seek. So we're back to national law. And in terms of evidentiary remedies, we've got a wide spectrum across EU member states, from those who accept any evidence obtained abroad, even if unlawful, even as a, from torture, to those like Ireland who apply fairly strict exclusionary rules. So basically, if a request was not proportionate or was issued by the wrong authority, it would be left to each individual member state to decide whether the data that came out of it can be used and based upon to, for conviction or on the contrary should be excluded. And this could also be very problematic for US-EU relations because exclusion is the usual response to an illegal search and seizure in the US. And this leads me to the third set of safeguards we would urge any framework for cooperation to include. And that's oversight mechanism on the use of this measure by law enforcement authorities. Now, the Cloud Act provides um, that to enter into an executive agreement, the foreign government must def demonstrate mechanisms to provide accountability and transparency regarding the collection and use of electronic data. 
European production order is poorer and just requires member states to collect and send each, day, each year data to the Commission and the Council added as far as possible. But yet you need oversight to guard against abusive use of tools that give massive powers to state authorities. And you need oversight to guard against simple human mistakes that can happen, like in the case of the police officer in the Liam Allen case. So to wrap up, like Alexandra, we see the developments in EU-US cooperation in the field of electronic data exchange as an opportunity to lead the way in creating a cooperation mechanism that facilitates investigation and prosecution of crime in a rights-compliant manner. So let's have effective safeguards from the beginning. First, a robust threshold for the issuing of data requests. Second, meaningful evidentiary remedies and crucially limiting gag orders in time and only when they're really needed. And third, effective oversight of law enforcement on the use of the data. And if we don't focus now on, the, on ensuring real and meaningful safeguards, these mechanisms will fail, calling in, uh, causing injustice to the people concerned and undermining our trust in our criminal justice systems. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laure. Uh, last, I'll ask Ken Harris to, from the US Mission to the European Union to speak. He is the Department of Justice representative here in Brussels, um, working on the full range of US-EU law enforcement cooperation and also is the liaison prosecutor of the United States to Eurojust in The Hague. Um, he has extensive experience negotiating uh, international agreements in the law enforcement realm between the United States and the EU, not least of which the hyper-complicated mutual legal assistance and extradition mechanisms, which those of us who had to implement them um, still blame him for. So, thank you. Thank you, Jason. And uh, I also want to thank uh, Marco and Seps for inviting me to this panel. It's really gratifying to uh, be able to take, place, uh, take part in a robust debate like this and to discuss really important issues. Uh, they really need to be discussed thoroughly because they're so important. And because they're important, they're also complex. And uh, because they're complex, there are certain misconceptions of, uh, of, of what is in involved. And what I'd like to do today is spend a little time first talking about uh, three common misconceptions about the Cloud Act, uh, some of which were raised uh, today, but which I've also heard raised in other panels and, and in other contexts. And I'll be, uh, I'll be very brief so that we have enough time for uh, questions from the audience and uh, among the panelists. Uh, the, the first uh, thing that uh, I'd like to talk about uh, goes back to Jason's original uh, story that he told when we started this panel about how, which, and I didn't know that story, but about how five or seven years ago, uh, his colleague from the UK, uh, uh, who he now has to buy beer for all the time, uh, said this is something that we should do with the US. But it, it is an important story in that the, the common perception is that the Cloud Act was created in order to provide some kind of new and expansive uh, coercive power for the US over other countries. And really nothing could be further from the truth. The original proposals by the Department of Justice in uh, 2015, I think, uh, it was the opposite. It, it was in order to help our law enforcement colleagues in other countries who justifiably were concerned that with so much information uh, being held by providers in the US, uh, and, uh, and in, in particular, the, the slowness of the mutual legal assistance process for obtaining stored uh, data, but also that uh, often the point in which if you were going to, as a law enforcement official, uh, try to conduct real-time interception <coughs> of communications, the only point to do that might be in the US, and there US law did not allow uh, for uh, real-time interception on the basis of uh, purely foreign conduct. So the purpose of the Cloud Act originally was to address the valid concerns of our uh, law enforcement partners that they needed to have uh, a way of uh, obtaining 
evidence for their criminal cases that was uh, supplemental to the mutual legal assistance process. Uh, and it was our effort to try to address that concern. Uh, it was not, so that was the purpose of the act, not for the purpose of creating a, any kind of new power. The, the, the part that many people think was the reason for the Cloud Act was really actually a subsequent development that arose because of the uh, litigation of the Microsoft Ireland case. So, the, the, again, many people believe that the Cloud Act creates a new coercive power, but that's wrong in two basic ways. The first way is that we already had that power, uh, as many countries do. And in fact, the reason that we had it is because we're required to have it by an international treaty that over 60 countries are a party to called the Budapest Cybercrime Convention. And in the Budapest Convention, Article 18 requires all parties to have the power to compel a legal or physical person in their territory to produce computer data, irrespective of whether it's in their territory or not, as long as that person, legal or physical, has custody or control over the data. So it's a requirement of international law that the US have that power, and it's the norm. Many countries have that power. So it's, I think that the discussion of the Cloud Act has to be rethought because at the moment it's proceeding under what is a false premise. Uh, the, um, uh, it's also, I think, important to note uh, that this power is used on, is also used, as I was saying, we're trying to help our foreign colleagues. We use the power to uh, assist our foreign colleagues who are trying to get evidence for their cases. So, for example, you, you, may, have, you may be aware, or at, at least at one point, uh, Google, for example, uh, the way in which they kept stored data was by breaking messages up into pieces, which they call shards, which, for the most part, were in motion uh, uh, on a regular basis, and it was very difficult to determine where and which country they were at any point in time. And uh, so it was impossible for our European and other international colleagues to uh, figure out if the information that they needed was in, a, in their country or in some other country, and having the ability to compel uh, Google to produce all of the data that they have that was sought by our foreign partners was critical to them getting the evidence that, that they needed to protect their public and to punish the guilty. So that, that's, that's what I would like to say about uh, the, the second common misperception about the Cloud Act. Uh, the third, uh, and I'm not sure if I want to characterize it as a misperception, but there are a lot of questions raised, and they've been raised today, about data protection and whether uh, the actions of, the, um, of, of a US prosecutor in seeking data, which may be stored in Ireland, which was the case uh, in the Microsoft Ireland case, whether that's compatible with, uh, with data protection. And uh, I have two things to say about that. First of all, the European Union in the Microsoft Ireland case filed a brief describing data protection law. And, it, and in the brief, the European Union uh, strongly suggested that Article 48 was not an obstacle to uh, the um, uh, sharing or the transfer of data sought uh, by a search warrant of the United States uh, that might uh, be um, 
satisfied by obtaining data stored in Ireland because Article 48 ends by saying that whatever restrictions it imposes are without prejudice to the other grounds for transfer under Chapter 5 of GDPR. Uh, so, uh, and, and among those, uh, it mentions uh, in, in the brief uh, several derogations that could have been applied uh, in, the, um, in the case uh, at hand. And uh, while a carefully constructed brief, uh, it, it did not in any way suggest that uh, this kind of um, uh, means of securing electronic evidence is necessarily incompatible with the GDPR. Uh, secondly, and I'll end it up after this, uh, as some of you may know, uh, the US already has a, an agreement with the European Union that uh, addresses data protection. It's the so-called umbrella agreement, uh, which entered into force in uh, 2017, I think. It might have been 2016. The umbrella agreement is generally applicable to transfers of personal data between criminal law enforcement authorities. However, the framework that the US uses in order to collect personal data, store personal data, use personal data, and dispose of personal data is essentially the same whether we're getting the information from our European law enforcement colleagues or we would be getting the information from uh, a, uh, an internet service provider or other private person. So uh, what I'm trying to say here mm -hmm. is that we have robust safeguards uh, I need for the we'll ask you to wrap up. I'll just finish the sentence. Yes. For the protection of personal data, and I don't see that it's a great leap to apply those uh, protections in this context. Thank you. Thanks, Ken. Um, thank you all for, for very excellent and, and, and um, enlightening contributions to the discussion. I, I, I'm going to take my prerogative as the moderator and ask the first question, if that's OK. Um, and specifically, I'd ask Michelle and Etienne if, if, you, if you might consider responding. Um, there's been much discussion uh, in these access to data uh, uh, conversations, uh, Cloud Act and e-evidence about um, European Union data protection law, and, and oftentimes uh, many of those discussions uh, focus on the idea that uh, US law or practice does not necessarily meet European data protection standards, it's a common theme. Um, as Ken intimated that with the Cloud Act, the purpose was it's hard to respond to foreign partners' requests for data, and, and the, volume, the reality is the volume of data requests very much go from Europe to the United States for electronic data, and not so much from the Euro United States government asking Europeans. And so with Article 48 and, and this proposed US-EU agreement, um, as, as Alexandra intimated, uh, many in industry think that's a, that's a great solution. My question is, Many in Washington uh, suspect that not all 28 members of the European Union would meet the rule of law standards in the Cloud Act. Um, and so even if the US government and the commission with the council's uh, uh, authority um, were to engage into an agreement, do you have any thoughts on what would happen or how the two sides might, pro pro might progress on these issues if, for instance, it were determined by the United States that only 25 or 24 member states really met all of the rule of law requirements that are in the, the Cloud Act. In other words, for purposes of the agreement, not all member states were created equal. Do you have any thoughts um, on, on, on how the two sides might, might address that? I, I asked the question, and it's lengthy, I apologize, I, just because there is another side to this equation about, about the protections um, on both sides, and a lot of times that gets lost in these discussions about this agreement. So I, I'm just curious if you've had any discussions or thoughts on that. Mm -hmm. Either, please. Okay. Okay. Well, I, I will uh, give an answer on my own behalf, and certainly not as a member of the Libya Secretariat. Well, the, the thing is, uh, as I mentioned in my, in my intervention, 
and the negotiations which are foreseen between the EU and the US, uh, according to the Commissioner, uh, shouldn't be uh, um, developed in the framework of the Cloud Act. That's the first thing. And uh, if the question is regarding the Cloud Act is um, if, uh, as regards the possibility of entering into an executive uh, agreement, how the, such an uh, executive agreement should be considered. Is it international agreement or not? Um, we can have some doubt because it doesn't seem that the principle or uh, the basic principle of reciprocity is um, respected here, uh, since uh, the, the, the Cloud Act foresees different rules as regard um, uh, the, the, the nationality of citizens, if they are Americans or not. So um, again, it's a personal uh, answer. Uh, I, I have doubts uh, uh, as regard the possibility into entering into an executive um, uh, agreement between the US and, um, and, the, um, and the EU, and so uh, so far it's not the uh, path envisaged by the commissioner. I didn't uh, reply to you uh, uh, directly as regards the question of rule of law, but and, and the, 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 the fact that in some member states, mm -hmm. according to your understanding, the rule of law uh, is not fully uh, applied, but again, your um, the starting point is a cloud act, and I'm not sure it uh, again that it's the, the way uh, which should be uh, followed by the commission in the negotiations. Okay, well, I'll open up to questions. Thank you. Um, please. Um, hi, thank you um, for the opportunity to ask a question. I have uh, uh, a brief comment and a specific question uh, regarding um, the comment from. Uh, Kenneth Harris from the Department of Justice. Um, it's true that uh, Article 18 of the Budapest Convention mentioned that, and it's also true that those powers were before uh, by the United States. But it's also true that technology, changing in technology has increased, and the amount of data that uh, is handled by US companies has increased since the adoption of the Budapest Convention. And that's why many NGOs around the world, not only in the United States, not only in the European Union, but also Latin America and other countries, join in Amicus to support the Microsoft Ireland case. And definitely that cre create a legal uncertainty about that provision because they needed to put it in the act. I don't think it's a broad expansion of what it was before, but. It, at least the way I describe the provision just by reading what it is sounds expansive just because how it's written. Um, now, um, on the question, and especially, especially, in special regarding the extraterritorial warrant, um, which is the standard for accessing data stored in Europe that was before and will be under the Cloud Act? It will be like a Title III warrant, like for the same standard that you have for Americans, or it's a different standard? Thank you. Ken. Well, the, 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 found, the fundamental uh, approach in, in cloud is that each country applies its own law to issue its own orders. So uh, if the UK is um, uh, file is, is um, issuing. Uh, uh, no, an and order. if I could interrupt you, I think you may have misunderstood the question. I think the question was in the other part of cloud, when the U.S. government seeks to compel the production of data in the United States um, from an entity that possesses the, or controls the data outside the United States, what is the legal standard? Does it change from an no. ordinary one? No, it's the same. We, well, we. The the. Um, so this is another thing that people get mixed up about. Uh, the, uh, the portion of the uh, Cloud Act that, that codified the, the prior practice and brought us into conformity with our obligations under the Budapest Convention deals with stored data. So there's no Title III. Title III is to capture uh, communications in real time. Uh, so that only applies to stored data, and yes, the answer to that is we use the same standard that we use when we're seeking content data, uh, which is a search warrant. 
with probable cause. Please. Okay, so thank you, Theodore Christakis, professor at the University of Grenoble Alps. I, I have two very quick questions. The first one is for uh, Michelle, but also a little bit for Laura and Alexandra. Uh, I've seen the list of the working documents that we expect from the Libe committee, and there is nothing about notification. I was wondering, because you have followed without any doubt very closely all these huge debates in the EU Council concerning notification between EU member states, um, the idea of a notification, of a notification as a sufficient uh, uh, additional guarantee has been acted, but there is a huge debate which state should be notified. Is it the enforcing state, the country of residence, <coughs> etc.? And I was a little bit surprised to see that this is not in your working documents list, so I was wondering uh, why and uh, if this debate exists also in the Libe Committee and more generally for Laura and Alexandra, don't you think that uh, this uh, notification mechanism could precisely provide guarantees by permitting states to uh, exercise their traditional protective functions. And the second question is to the CNIL and Ken Mori and uh, more broadly to the European Data Protection Board. Do you agree with the interpretation of the, the Department of Justice concerning uh, Article 48 and 49, uh, um, especially in the light of the guidelines that the European Data Protection Board published last June uh, in concerning the interpretation of the derogations, including the public interest uh, derogation of, of Article 49, which personally, when I read it, gives me the impression that there is a problem with uh, uh, Article 48, 49, that 49, uh, that the derogation, the public interest derogation cannot be used uh, in order to legitimize all uh, these transfers uh, of European personal data uh, to uh, United States law enforcement authorities. So I was wondering what is your position uh, about this interpretation of the Department of Justice? Thank you. Yes, um, as regards the question of notification, the, the answer, is, in fact, is quite simple. Uh, since the, the, the Parliament works on the basis of the Commission's proposal, and so uh, in the co Commission's proposal, you don't have the notification. The, the, it's only when uh, an agreement has been um, uh, f has been found in the f in the Parliament that uh, at the end of the day there will be, as you know, the trilogues, and then uh, the both uh, co-legislators will discuss on the two uh, texts they have adopted on each side. And at that time, at, at that moment, for sure, uh, the question of identification uh, will be dealt. It might be dealt before inside the parliament uh, when discussing uh, the, the different articles. But indeed, it's not in the original uh, text of the commission. That's why, for the moment, since we are studying the text of the commission, we, we haven't approached this uh, uh, just sorry, just uh, the idea is to improve the Commission's proposal, uh, so eventually the notification should not be excluded because it's not there, because eventually the Parliament, the Libre Committee, could introduce this idea in order to improve the Commission's proposal. At, the, at that stage, of course, nothing is uh, uh, excluded, for sure. Any comments? Yeah. Yes, we, we would agree that notification, like I said, is, is key notification to the suspect, but um, where that's not possible for the purposes of the investigation, and that should be very tightly defined as well and controlled, um, the state of residency of the suspect should be informed. I mean, this is, otherwise we'd be a situation, for instance, where Polish authorities could be seeking data from Google in Ireland about a German citizen, and Germany would not know, and that is a real question of sovereignty where you're preventing uh, the state of the citizen from exercising its protective function over its citizens. I fully agree with you, Laura. Um, this is really something we've been um, asking for, and it's an important first step towards transparency and accountability. However, um, I think it would be incomplete without a proper recourse framework for the member states. Uh, France, my homeland, being like, okay, I've seen this, I don't agree with this, and I'm going to go talk to um, the Romanian authority about that, ask them questions, ask them why, and have some kind of oversight. And without that right and precise framework for this oversight, it would be a very important first step, but only a first step. Hello. Oh, I'm sorry, that's the second question, I apologize. Yeah. Yes, uh, thank you for, for your question, uh, uh, which actually welcome, because indeed I think uh, 
our interpretation might differ. First of all, you refer indeed to um, a brief uh, filed by the EU uh, in front of the Supreme Court. I'd just like to clarify, it's filed by the European Commission, which is the executive oh, yeah, of the... It's filed by the European Commission, which as a role is also the guardian of the treaty in charge of good implementation of EU law. From my point of view, as Data Protection Authority, we are uh, in charge of the application of the GDPR and the enforcement of this law. Um, with the other authorities, we develop common interpretation because we are the one then which will have to enforce the text. Um, and on Article 48, indeed, the general principle is that to make a, a, an order enforceable, there needs to be an international agreement, but it's indeed without prejudice to other legal bases of transfer. And this mainly referred to other legal bases, in this case, transfer by derogation, Article 49. And there, the uh, Data Protection Authority, the European Data Protection Board, has developed a lengthy guidance to detail and analyze how we will interpret and implement this derogation. When it comes to public interest, we kind of, overall, we already said that should be um, all this derogation applied restrictively. Um, and for public interest, we said it should be defined by EU or national law. Therefore, public interest of the EU or of a member state. Therefore, not the public interest of a third country. So that's why we still think, indeed, derogation is are possible. For example, the vital interest of a person. And that's even a, a legal basis for processing the Article 6 of the GDPR. So there might be cases, of course, that if it's for the vital interest of the data subject concern, that then the derogation could be used and we don't need to have a, an international agreement. Or, so the message is also the EU data protection framework does allow to have access, but it has to, to comply with primary and secondary law. And the last comment is on the Budapest Convention. Um, already, we agree with Article 18 that foresee already such mechanism. Um, the authorities, we have an interpretation also of Article 32 regarding who is the person to whom it can be addressed. And again, Data Protection Authority, already in 2013, have said that normally the person referred to Article 32 is not an indi individual or, uh, let's say, a service provider, but should be the person which is legally entitled to um, process the disclosure, therefore a national authority. And Ken, you wanted you had something to add? Yeah, I just wanted to make uh, one clarification, or uh, in my understanding of what the guidelines on Article 49 says, it, it, as I understand it, it, it does not say that the public interest must be laid down in union or member state law. It says something more nuanced than that, which foresees uh, that where there are cooperative relationships. Uh, that are uh, advanced by the transfer, that that would be appropriate. And here we're talking about the kinds of uh, issues that would be very much covered by the Budapest Convention, to which virtually every EU member state is a party. Thanks. Please. Hello, uh, my name is Andrea Lisiewicz. I'm a data protection attorney. And since I had a lot of questions, but we don't have time, I'm just going to stick to one. And uh, that is whether it has been considered, especially in the EU, and I'm looking at Etienne right now, that uh, a situation where, say, we have uh, the Microsoft search warrant all over again, and the entity is ordered in the US to hand over data that is processed by its subsidiary in the EU by uh, relating to EU persons, um, if that's not a case where the US entity becomes a joint controller with its EU subsidiary, and as a consequence, held directly liable for breaches of GDPR, including the possibility to transfer, not observing data, uh, data subject rights like access, and well, everything else. In my view, that would be the case, but I haven't seen any analysis on this, so I was wondering what's your opinion on it. Thank you. Um, indeed, I mean, there's no official position because we haven't adopted and developed. Um, the only thing I can say is that, indeed, if I'm correct in the, the cloud that it refers to uh, data which is in um, possession, custody, or control of this service provider. So, indeed, the question of, like, possession could be um, uh, only a, um, a processor uh, that would be in possession, but then in control, it could relate to a controller, so have a, a broader reach. And now we also have to, I guess, that one another layer of complication is also the evolution of the case law regarding joint controllership. 
So um, if you allow me, uh, I mean, I agree with you that it, it raised uh, new complexity and new issues, but I, I, I'll, I'll refrain from uh, giving you a personal, uh, publicly personal analysis. Thanks. I think we have time for just one more, so please. Yeah, and this is a very quick one. Um, we always hear that um, the EU doesn't want to um, negotiate under the Cloud Act um, framework. Um, so is there any indication from the US side if they are willing to do it on an, in, in another framework, in a, especially for the EU? Uh, presumes the US is willing to do it at all, but um, I'll, ask, <laughs> I'll ask Ken to, to respond. Well, uh, we haven't, there isn't even a, a negotiating mandate from the EU yet, and uh, I'm sure they'll be in touch when there is, uh, <laughs> and we'll, we'll be informed by what takes place at that time. But I, I do have to say that uh, just as the EU is a, an area uh, of the rule of law and respect for law, so is the US, and uh, to the, the extent to which we can enter into agreements that um, lift our uh, obstacles uh, under current law is laid down in the Cloud Act. And so just as you have to comply with GDPR and other laws in the EU, we have to comply with uh, what Congress has, uh, has legislated. And um, if we, you, I, a little known part of the Cloud Act is that, uh, first of all, uh, the agreement has to be certified by the Attorney General and the Secretary of State as meeting the requirements that are set forth in the Act. And secondly, Congress has the opportunity to reject any agreement that it feels doesn't comply with the terms of the Act. Thank you very much to everyone um, for your contributions and thank you for your questions. Um, yes, thanks, uh, thanks a lot. Thanks for the, for the contributions.